The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John. And Jesus led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before him. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. <coughs> then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had been raised from the dead. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. On this Transfiguration Sunday, we once again hear of the magnificent change in Jesus, an announcement from God that this is God's beloved Son, and we should listen to him. We hear of the visit from Elijah and Moses, and how our much beloved Peter is being all Peter-like. Peter is so overcome by the sight of Elijah and Moses that all he can think about is preserving this moment in time. So Peter speaks of building tents or, or dwellings or um, whatever your translation may say uh, to, to keep this moment memorialized. Um, instead of being in this moment of, of seeing his Lord transfigured and Moses and Elijah, instead of breathing in all that intoxication of holiness and awe and splendor and wonder, Peter moves right past it all, right into the Kodak movement. All right, now you guys squish together so I get a picture. Yeah, okay. Jesus smiled just a little bit more. Okay, good, good. Okay, now get the disciples in. Come on, James, come on. Get in there. Okay, good, good. Okay, wait, one more just in case. That's Peter. He didn't even get the opportunity by his own choosing to just revel in all that was happening around him. Yeah. I can just see all that happening. But even though Peter is being Peter, we love Peter. We are so much like Peter. But this morning what I'd like for us to look at instead is one line in, in our reading this morning. And it may say differently in your translation, but as they were coming down the mountain, one sentence, as they were coming down the mountain. I think this is a really important sentence. They came down the mountain. Jesus came down, knowing what he was going to face. Jesus came down the mountain, knowing he would be cast out of his own hometown, knowing he would be betrayed by his beloved disciples, knowing he would die such an egregious death. Jesus came down the mountain. Wow. This is a wow moment. Jesus came down the mountain. So what does this say about Jesus? Well, it says one thing. To me, it says Jesus was living out the Ten Commandments. Uh, in particular, this one, honor thy mother and thy father. Uh, though we know when Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, he asks his Heavenly Father to have this cup taken away, if that is possible. But otherwise, Jesus honored his Father 
by walking into the life that would lead to his death. So we know that about Jesus. Jesus coming down the mountain means Jesus really, really, and I can't stress this enough, really loves us. Jesus could have stayed on the mountain. He could have stayed basking in all that glowy, showy brightness. But he didn't. Jesus came down on the mountain for us. What kind of love is this? What kind of love is this that it makes you leave such a beautiful experience as Jesus was in to come down to live a life you know will only lead to a horrific death? What kind of love is that? Who does that? Who does that? A man conceived in a miracle, raised up in the synagogue as, to become a teacher and a leader, a man both human and divine, Jesus, Son of God, Son of Man, loving God's children in such a way that he would lay his own life down for us, for us. Jesus came down the mountain to be in the midst of our despair, to be in the muck and mire of our lives. God and Jesus came down the mountain. He came down the mountain and he came down from heaven. And as the creed tells us, and for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And isn't that what our faith is all about? God coming to us in Jesus. Coming so that we would have life, life abundantly, and life eternal. Not just to exist in this life but to flourish and to grow and to become more than we could ever be in our own selfish ways. Jesus came down the mountain so we could be more. Dr. David Lose, who, is, um, who was a president of a seminary, who now is the... Um, presiding pastor in one of the churches in Minnesota says this so beautifully. God who created and still sustains the vast cosmos not only knows that we exist, but cares. God cares about our ups, our downs, our hopes, our disappointments. God cares about our dreams and our despairs. God cares about all things we care about? Have you ever given that much thought? You weren't put here just to sit in a pew this morning. You weren't here to give birth to beautiful children. You weren't here to be a friend to somebody. You weren't here just to be here living in Niobrara, Nebraska. You were here because God knew that you would be important to his ministry, to all his children. God cares about you and thinks about you and loves you like nobody else on earth will ever be able to do. So what kind of love is that? That's God love. God's love means we are never alone in our life and on our, or in our faith journey. God's love means we are never alone as we walk from life to death. We are never alone in the darkest pits of despair. Recall from your childhood the, the Bible stories of um, of, of he, Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego, and and how they were taught that they were to be killed, and gee, God never let that happen. He cared about these men. 
that not rocks or fire or anything else could put them to death. God cared about them. God cares about that premature born baby who weighs two pounds and probably shouldn't in another life have been able to live. But because God cares about tiny, tiny little babies, he had beautiful brains put into some of his children who would be able to make that teeny tiny little baby not only live and thrive, but end up having a beautiful life ahead of them. Because God cares about us. Some people want to, many people, want to separate science from faith, from God, science and God. They think don't go together. But I want to share with you this morning that those scientists, those really, really smart people, God made them. God made them with the brain that they have so they can do things like save our tiniest little creatures. So they can find cures for polio or they can make medications to make our life as we, as we begin to age and not everything in our body continues to work. But there are medicines that can be taken so that life may not be the same, but it's comfortable. God made those people to have those minds to be able to do that. God made Adam at Moody Motors so that he would have a mind to be able to look at a beat up Jeepers and go, we can fix that. I gotta take it apart, but we can fix your Jeepers. See, God didn't give me that brain. He did give me a brain, so don't even go there. <laughs> God gave Adam that kind of brain that can do that. Because God cares about all of his children. All of his children. And all of this is possible because why? He loves us. That's a good one. <laughs> What's the front of your bulletin say? The king. Yes, sir, Randy. Say it again loud. <laughs> yes, please. Say it again, please. Because he came down from the mountain. Because he came down from the mountain. And if that doesn't deserve an alleluia, I don't know what does. So all God's children say, Alleluia. Alleluia. Thank you very much. Esther, it's time to sing. 